Thank you very much, Melissa. I think um, as we progress through some of the, uh, the talks today, we are um, revealing what is, I guess, known, but the complexities around um, much of, sorry, I'm just finding the next slide, much of um, uh, the challenges that people face both as, as users and consumers of digital content, but also the creators, and then those people that want to uh, leverage on that. Um, and I think that leads nicely into our next speaker, Becky Sweet Chen Freeman, who uh, leverages the digital realm um, to assist people in consuming imagery. Becky is the producer for Art Processes, a company that designs and de develops visitors, visitor-centric mobile experiences for cultural institutions. Becky has worked as an independent creative producer throughout the last decade since receiving her Bachelor of Arts in Communications from the University of Technology here in Sydney. With a passion for storytelling across multiple platforms and mediums, her work has spanned the production of interactive and digital content, including exhibitions, websites, online documentaries in gallery interactive content, film and sound production. Throughout these varied projects, Becky has worked alongside programmers and designers who strive to seamlessly integrate technology into the core exhibition experience, thus allowing visitors to connect more deeply to the stories being told. Thank you, Becky. I'm going to add to that introduction. There's so many things that people have said that I've like scribbled down, so I'm going to try and bring those into my talk, but then I might also save them for the panel. Um, a disclaimer, I'm also a musician and an artist, so I kind of feel quite passionately about copyright and definitely uh, just from what everybody said, I also have those same struggles that we've all mentioned about how to uh, use those kind of platforms. Um, yeah, mu music is like great at the moment, but it's also terrible. And um, yeah, the, the kind of, if you look at the Spotify percentage of money that you get per play, it's uh, there's not enough space in an Excel spreadsheet column to like, you know, add the zeros up. So yeah, anyway, and also as, as a designer, I should also say this discussion, I, I don't think there's any specific graphic designers, but heaps of copyright uh, infringement in that area too, in terms of just icons, me using an icon, that's like an iOS standard icon is a breach of um, copyright with Apple when I'm using an, making an app for like, an Apple device, it's really bizarre and weird. So there's a lot of other things I could talk about, but today I'm gonna to really focus on one of our main projects, which is um, the Mona O app. So I don't know, maybe some of you have been to Tasmania, and um, ha who's been to Tasmania <laughs> and been to, and ha have you used the O, the guide? So I, I won't like describe so much, you know, how it works, because most of you will, will know that, but I'll kind of talk about what goes into that kind of a project and my experience in museums and having worked across lots of other kinds of digital projects that aim to do a similar thing, but um, for lack of time, research and development, just haven't been able to achieve it in the same way that Mona, Mona has, um, predominantly because it started at the very inception of the gallery itself. So that's a huge thing for this. Um, so, Mona uh, is a whole experience and when you're adding a digital component to your exhibition or your collection, um, you really have to, I think this is a video that's not playing right now, anyway, you really have to um, encapsulate the whole visitor experience in your planning for that and that's what Art Processes is there to do. So whilst I do all this kind of freelance production and stuff, I, I work very closely with art processors who aim to create digital immersive, immersive experiences within the cultural sector, so not just art galleries, um, but also museums with more science and historical focus. So in that sense, I won't be just talking about image or the artist's image, but we, we would say object or um, content, which kind of sounds a bit gross, but you know, that's what it is. Like in, in that context, it's it's, yeah, what is content? It, it's so many things, but it, it's the data and information that you're wanting to communicate to the audience. So um, our platform is really designed around that. So we work with collections for an exhibition. Um, so intrinsically that the platform actually can pull directly from 
your museum collection database, it can be really painstaking and obviously there's like five billion different things you have to do to get to that specific bit of content. But we, you know, we've, we've actually got quite a good system and that's what we've, we've designed um, it specifically for, to work in this sector. So in that sense, there's no middleman, there's no like potential for that copyright information getting lost because we're getting it direct from the source. So that's kind of a cool thing about this. I'm kind of like the good guy in the digital platform world. I'm posing myself as, as that, because yeah. So um, the inception of Mona. So I've worked with Art Processes for two years and it's really since 2011. So um, that was when Art Processes formed with the O. So the O was the first project and probably to this day is still the most fully realized um, version of what we want to do. So what I'm showing you here is basically where it all started, which was actually as an internal tool to like visualize data for curators, for exhibition producers and for um, artists as well to kind of see where their work's at within a much larger context of, an, of a collection. So the project itself was just kind of like a pet project for David Walsh and he worked with a team of people which then became art processors who were really smart and really good at, at like just turning his you know, hotshot ideas into actually something that was really, um, really well put together and constructed and, and robust. So they had this amazing back-end data visualization of how they could navigate their collections, which I think someone mentioned before, um, maybe it was Michaela, people at museums and institutions are working really hard to digitize their collections so they can come up to speed with social media. Well, this was kind of happening in a different way um, several years ago with Mona. This is kind of part of that data visualization, probably also inspired why it was called the O. I'm just postulating that, I don't know if it's true. There's lots of theories on why it's called the O, but um, so it's kind of interesting. It started as an internal tool and then, you know, to make this, which is actually a picture of what Mona was before, if you can believe it or not, um, it's not as nearly as, as exciting as, as what it is now, but to make this whole experience um, much more interactive, to really change up the visitor pathways in which people can interact with these kinds of collection and also to increase the points of connection, emotional connection that people can have with the objects. And by doing that, you also have to create new kinds of content alongside the actual object. And, and so that's what uh, the O does really well. So this is like the ambition of the software that our processes produced. We wanted to, well, David Walsh was really um, set on removing all wall label text from within the gallery and just enabling people, empowering the visitor with a tool that they could hold on a handheld device, walk around the space and get all the information they need or not get the information they need, get other information they don't need and respond to that and hate it. Be like, why the hell are you telling me this? That's really offensive. I hate it. But he, he wanted to get that emotional response or maybe people are like, this is great. This is actually speaking to me. I wouldn't have looked at this otherwise, but now I have this other per person's opinion that is really helping me connect to the artwork. So that was the ambition and the main aim of um, the O to begin with. So this is kind of just showing you, demonstrating what the software was aiming to do. People can walk around, they can listen to little audio ex extracts. They don't have to even do anything. It, it'll just kind of, as you know, you've used it. Um, you can say what's near me and it'll show you what's in front of you. At the moment, we're actually updating the whole experience, which I can't say too much about now because I don't think we've finished it yet. So I could say, oh, it's gonna do this, this, and this, but then come July, it may not be where it's um, intended to be at, but um, basically we'll add new things where people can, visitors have even more of a voice. Um, again, someone mentioned earlier, how much do you give the public? How much control do you give? Well, I can tell you about one of the funny features I think is kind of cool, but could be a total disaster, which is called um, uh, rant. So it's like just people, basically a lot of the feedback we get, and it comes through on my email just at random times of the day, I'll be like, <laughs> that's a funny piece of feedback. Um, people just like write the most interesting things about their responses. They, they feel really liberated when they have this field that they have to, you know, oh, I've got this whole thing, I'm gonna really express myself. And we're kind of, taking that learning and seeing how 
often that feature was used on the app and turning it into like a, it'll become some kind of installation where those rants are presented in the space. Well, that's the idea. As offensive as they are, as negative as they are, as positive as, as they are, that's really something that is possible at an institution like Mona, maybe not many other institutions, but yeah, so that, that could, be, uh, could be something to look out for and to, a reason to go visit again. Um, well, this video is working. This is what it looks like in the back end. So this is like the kind of things that goes into making that seamless visitor experience, which is like so much painstaking, like technical, tedious tasks of, um, this is actually syncing all, all the devices. So maybe I should talk a bit about um, art processes. If you, if you Google art processes, you'll probably get indoor location or locative aware content, Bluetooth beacons. Basically what that all means um, is just finding the best way to utilize the technology that's out there to be able to predict where the visitor is within the gallery to deliver um, content that is relevant to where they are. So within the context of where they're standing, they might get something about the artwork in front of them or you know, in the nearby area. And that technology has changed dramatically in the last five years. It went from costing like half a million dollars to install something like this in an in institution to something like $30,000 with Bluetooth um, low energy. And Bluetooth low energy is basically within every Apple, iPod, I, iPhone device um, from like generation four onwards. So it's pretty much just there available to use. Um, so that's a huge jump that our processes have had to adapt to and um, like other institutions can now benefit from that because of the low cost. So we've been working with a lot of smaller institutions doing smaller projects. Um, to really see how they might be able to benefit. And that's been really interesting as well. When, when it's not within the fabric from the architecture, architectural design of the space, how does this indoor location software really work? Well, in honesty, sometimes it doesn't really give you that much more because we're still learning. A lot of the projects I've worked on seem more like experiments um, and research really, and, that's, and prototypes, and that's probably what they should be thought of at this point in time. I worked on conversations in the Asian Art Gallery last year with Francesca, who works at this institution here. And um, that was like an interesting little little addition, additional content um, that we provided for that exhibition. But um, the thing with additional content is that when it's additional, you're giving visitors the chance to say, oh, I don't need it, it's additional. So there's all these kinds of bits of information I'm just like spitting out at you. but. I've got a lot of knowledge just based on like doing these projects over and over again and realizing how difficult it is to actually create a really good and necessary digital project within that sits on top of the artwork that's not just competing with it. So um, it's, there's no right answer, there's no right way to go and a lot of these things are still very experimental still. Um, so because of the work that went into Mona and, and the, the four years that the team worked on it, this is the kind of gallery experience you can expect. There's no text in the space, it's dark, there's, but it's hard to see, it's um, confusing, you can easily get lost. And that was definitely the goal, is to allow people to get lost in a hopefully less nauseating way than what you do when you scroll Instagram and you get sick in the car and you're like, what am I doing? Um, hopefully it's, it's a good lost and you discover new things because you're not um, sending any, uh, following any predetermined path that a curator has set out for you, you're just discovering it for yourself. So um, this next uh, slide, as the people that have used the O would know, this is just showing the kind of content. I won't go into it in too much detail, but you know that's pretty rare to get that kind of those kind of icons in an art gallery. Actually, it was the art wank one. We were saying I was saying personally that I found it exclusive um, to like me as a female. But I, I wasn't really being that serious about it. But I was like, actually, like that's a bit annoying. But you know, again, that's the intended response, but I was also like, I guess you couldn't change it to anything else, really. So, um, but you might see some new icons. Yeah, it's, it's, it's playful though, and it looks illustrative, and you expect it to kind of look like that. And now that it's already, they put it out there, they offended people, they can keep offending people. That's the other great thing about <coughs> taking these big risks. And with digital immersion, you actually do have to take a huge jump. You can't just do like, oh, little baby step, we'll add this 
like that's not going to make a difference. That's not going to give you any learnings. You have to like take a huge jump to actually get anything back and be prepared to fail and fail and fail and fail and just treat them as experiments. Um, that's the only way that you'll end up finding out what you actually need to do because the visitors aren't going to tell you what they want because they don't know. They, they know the social media kind of uh, way of interacting, but there's so many possibilities that we could kind of explore in this kind of museum and gallery space, which is where I'm working. Let's, um, I haven't even touched on where it could go working directly with artists, but um, at one of the MOFO uh, festivals in Tasmania, they did actually use the O sonically, so a sound emanated when you walked in a particular space and everyone's devices kind of emitted the same sound or slightly different tonal differences. And, and that was a really interesting way of using that indoor location software within a specific artist's work. So there's a whole other realm that people can be thinking of. But at the moment, we've mostly worked with, you know, collections and exhibitions. So even we have to break out of this kind of, like, um, this structure to actually create these new experiences. Um, so this is an example of what it looks like you most of you would know and it's kind of changing slightly can't show you that yet but i'm kind of curious to see what the feedback is that we get from the changes um for example like you know one i was again i'm always like offended by these changes and the designs just happen i'm like why did you move the nearest button to there it's like it's not intuitive but you know these are the things you have to do to like i was saying before to to make any improvements you have to kind of be prepared to make these mistakes so it's going to change a bit from from this um like I said, that rant feature, and there'll be a few other features um, added. One of the things we've learned about features, oh, so this is actually, sorry, this is just demonstrating the different types of pathways that visitors can take when you do break down the kind of, you know, the structure of having a label and walking up and having to read it and then walk into the next one and that need that you, when you see all that information to kind of consume it all in some kind of chronology. Um, Mona really breaks that down and allows you to just go with what you're feeling, or maybe you saw something pop up because of the little thumbnail image on your device that was that's near you that you didn't actually see when you're in the space, so you can then um, go and explore that. So it's really enabling getting lost and discovery and um, exploration in, in a new kind of way. So um, the other thing that has been great is that actually the age group that is using it that we got feedback from is much older than you would think. A lot of, I think it was like 55 to 65 year old demographic was highly responsive and um, and the specific comments were, you know, were really encouraging. They found it really easy to use, helpful. Um, they used it most of the time, like 90% of the time or, or things like this that we learned. And a lot of people that would probably have you know, would be offended by the David's collection anyway, were often giving negative feedback. So <laughs> I, I read a great review on a gardening blog, actually, a gardening architecture blog of this woman who just, she's like, I went to the, you know, the gallery, I got off the, we, we didn't catch the ferry, it was too expensive. I don't know what she said. She just said she didn't catch the ferry and she caught the bus and they had to walk up a hill. And then the sign that was, you know, pointing to the museum said toilets. And she was like, that's not the museum. And like, obviously that's the point. So it's not speaking to those, those people that don't find the humor in that kind of, <laughs> that kind of situation. Um, an example of the older demographic that I was saying. So, so basically I should just go back to that actually. So this is the thing that you get with the O. You get this participation, this participatory kind of discussion with other visitors. You get feedback instantly like, oh, X amount of people also like this. That's kind of cool. Um, what does that actually make you feel? We're, we're kind of still learning that and we're about to do another evaluation, um, you know, through the course of this next rollout and update to the O that will maybe tell us some of those things and what it actually means. It, it plays into that social media kind of trend a bit. So whether that's a good or a bad thing, um, it's a language that people are used to. So we'll see how it progresses. It, we, we hope that it kind of engages people more. That's the point to kind of get people more emotionally connected. So. Um, you know, there's, there's been feedback like, why can't you just have a neutral face? Why do you have to love or hate it? Um, and in apps that I've worked on since or, or experiences that I've worked on since, we did have a neutral face. It's very confusing, just like a line. And like, and in fact, it was for a, a war exhibition. And, you know, it was like they, 
I wasn't in charge of this particular element of the design, but you had to give feedback as to what you felt. And of course, everybody's sad. It was like horrific. So we just got all of the negative feedback for that for that particular experience because of the the iconography was confusing. So there's funny things like that that happen. Um, so this is the other great thing about this kind of software. You can learn a lot about your visitors, um, learn about the demographics that you're attracting. Don't have to make changes to those demographics, but you can. You can speak more, offer, oh, look, we're missing that kind of demographics. Speak more to them. You can see what was popular within a certain type of, um, you know, maybe there's a school group that went in and they all, that piece of artwork appealed to them, all this kind of thing, although I don't know if school groups are allowed in this museum. Um, but, yeah, so this kind of save tour feature is actually interesting. About, I think, 92% of um, people that were surveyed said that they loved it. That's one of the reasons that they used it, because they wanted to, you know, that need to collect everything. And then 42% actually used it. So some features are just like that. People want them. It's like when you pack for a trip and you pack 10 outfits, but you only wear two. You just kind of want the option, whether you use it or not. Does that make it a good digital experience? I don't know. So you guys to tell me. Um, Seb Chan is now working for Acme, but at the time, um, he was working for the Cooper Hewitt Design Museum, which had the Cooper Hewitt pen. That was a really innovative kind of tool, um, similar in the scale to the O as well, or maybe better, I don't know. Um, so he had this positive thing to say that it wasn't really, as he would have expected, directing people to look more at their screens, but kind of encouraged them to you know, explore the space a bit more. Other feedback says that it even encouraged dialogue. People maybe would laugh or, or talk with other people that they might not often talk to within the gallery. So it's kind of interesting to just observe what happens when you when you do provoke people and take that ex extra risk and break out of the confines of this kind of language that is so commonly used in in museum spaces? Um, I'm actually not going to talk so much about this, um, but I will talk about other things whilst we're looking at the pretty pictures of people enjoying the Melbourne Zoo experience. But um, this is one of the other types of projects that we've worked on. Basically. Like I said, we work with collections and exhibitions. A zoo is a, an organization which has a collection of animals. So um, we curated an experience to target a younger demographic who, weren't, who, who the zoo were kind of missing. And um, it was like an audio, spatial audio tour. So what we've learned in the last five years with Mona is that, okay, great, we've got people using these devices. Um, sometimes people, and particularly people within this industry, Maybe they go to a museum to escape looking at a device or to escape having headphones on or to escape technology. So sometimes there is no real solution that, that needs to happen that's digital. There's nothing wrong. That's not always the answer. And that's pretty much what all of the staff at Art Processes often say if someone wants a project. We're like, do you really need an app? Because maybe you don't. And, and then we go backwards from there and work out what problem they're trying to solve. But um, spatial audio is really interesting because We've been able to do really interesting things at in um, war memorials. Uh, there was a lot of funding within like the centenary for World War One that happened, uh, started in 2014. I've worked on maybe like four different World War One apps, and one of them was a spatial audio tour that um, really, really used the technology. I think to one of the best, um, like the best result. Basically, you walk around and is different tracks that are triggered and maybe there's a background effects track and then a narration that comes in. But the whole, like I said, designed within the fabric of the whole exhibition. So it's from the ground up was designed to have that in there. So there's, there's no competing text as you're reading the, uh, hearing the narration. Um, it's kind of, Michaela mentioned the Bowie exhibition at Acme had narration playing whilst you're trying to like read something. Um, there's, there's very good and very bad examples of this kind of stuff, but that's the, the direction where it's heading. Um, I've got to wrap it up, but I've got a lot more to say, so maybe we can save it for like the question time. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna, I'm not even gonna show you those pictures, I'll just leave it on that. M whimsical woman having a nice digital experience in an organization. <laughs>